<laughs> Hello guys, welcome to the video lesson on language and linguistics. As we have seen in the previous video lesson, linguistics is a scientific study of language. The word was first used in the middle of the 19th century to emphasize the difference between a newer approach to the study of language that was then developing in the more traditional approach of philology and we have seen in a very detailed aspects how linguistics was first termed and named as philology and then later on the linguists they have changed or altered the name to what we call today as linguistics. So the differences were, they were largely matters of attitude, emphasis and purpose. So philologist, the olden days we called them philologists and now we call a philologist a uh, linguist. Okay, so the philologist is concerned primarily with the historical development of languages as it is manifested or expressed in written text or in the context of the associated literature and culture. So the linguist, even if he may be interested in written text and the development of languages through time, he gives priority, he gives importance to spoken languages and to the problems of analyzing them as they operate at a given point in time. That is the difference between a philologist and a linguist. A philologist primarily is concerned with the historical. He traces the history, the lineage and origin of languages. They are manifested or how they are documented in the written form and how they are defined or explained in the context of literature and culture. But that is not the case with a linguist. A linguist is purely a scientist. We'll have an upcoming video lesson on linguistics as a science. How do you juxtapose or how do you attribute linguistics as a science? Do you consider how far you call linguistics as a science? So you will have an exclusive video lesson for that. So the linguist is different from a philologist basically because he prioritizes spoken languages, the spoken discourses. He is his focus and his emphasis on the speech, the verbal form, what is being uttered or rendered. Okay. Now the field of linguistics can be divided into three I mean dichotomies. What do you mean by dichotomy? It's a difference. It's a uh, division or separation or the contrast of, for example, the dichotomy between man and woman, day and night, light and darkness. So there goes the dichotomy, the, the sharp distinction, the the sharp division, you can call it, as being as things are sky, earth and sky, how they are presented in contrast and sharp division. So there is, of course, Three distinctions, you can say, okay, where linguistics is divided into theoretical linguistics and applied linguistics. And then you have a second kind that is uh, synchronic linguistics or synchronic approach to linguistics as well as diachronic approach to linguistics. And then you have something called the microlinguistics versus the macrolinguistics. So these are the different dichotomies. I shall explain it in detail in the upcoming videos and as our videos, the lessons move on gradually. Don't worry about that. So here in this particular video lesson, we will be uh, focusing on two distinctions where you have the different branches of uh, linguistics where the difference between the general linguistics and the comparative linguistics and then you have the linguistics a very broad and massive distinction between theoretical linguistics and applied linguistics so we shall leave the particular distinction or the dichotomy of the synchronic approach versus the diachronic approach to another exclusive uh, video lesson where we'll be delineating on Noam Chomsky okay, and his uh, synchronic and diachronic and Sassur and all those guys. Okay, 
So here we shall move on to branches of linguistics. Fine. Now, language in general and particular can be studied from different points of view. You can study, you can uh, trace uh, the study of uh, Malayalam language from, what you say, the 15th century or 14th century or what do you say 19th century you can trace it you study English you study English literature from 14th century you trace it likewise we are not talking about literature or art or film or anything we are talking about the system of language sound symbol graphic script etc etc from different points of view so therefore the field of linguistics as a whole can be divided into different uh, subfields according to the point of view so the first d distinction is between general and descriptive so descriptive linguistics so keep in mind one thing that linguistics is of course a scientific study of language where the three aspects of the study of the language a languages form its meaning and its context. So, language is studied in language is scientifically and systematically and analytically and empirically studied on the three three aspects. That is the form of the language, the basic appearance or the physical appearance as you see the language, how it is written or scripted or how it is documented and the meaning the semantics of language and then you have the language in its context the situation the situation the circumstance uh, and how it produces evolves or how, how it attributes to the prospects of a language now here the first distinction can be made between gender linguistics and uh, where gender linguistics is divided further into descriptive, historical, and comparative. You have the definitions, very sharp, very slight differences between all these branches. You can't say that they are different. You can't say that they are same. Okay. Now, what is gender linguistics concerned with? Gender linguistics is a study of scientific study of human language in all its manifestation and usage. That's how... Uh, it is how language is used inside your family, how language is used outside your family, how it is used inside and outside your neighborhood, how it is used uh, in the past, in the present, everything. In whatever way language is being manifested, it studies that without any restriction, regardless of time, place or culture. How language is used in Asia, how language is used in Europe, all over. It's a global phenomenon. The word comes under gender linguistics and it supplies the concepts and categories in terms of which particular language. It studies all the languages. You can't say that gender under gender linguistics only English is being studied or analyzed. Or you can't say that only Persian language or Latin or uh, what do you say, uh, the Asian language, the Sanskrit, the Arabic. Every language is all over the globe, all over the earth. All over the whole world is being studied under general linguistics. And it's a scientific study of the theoretical basis for describing language and methods of investigating linguistic phenomena. Okay. Now, we shall move on to uh, this first distinction. That's what I told you. The general linguistics, which studies all languages in general, and where you have descriptive linguistics, which studies particular languages in descriptive linguistics you can say that yes you are learning or you are analyzing the structure form the origin evolution of Persian language okay that's descriptive linguistics now general linguistics supplies concepts and categories in terms of which particular languages are to be analyzed but in the case of a descriptive linguistics it gives you the data which confirms or refutes, which goes against the propositions and theories put forward in gender linguistics. So they are by no means unrelated. They are related to each other. Okay. Yes. 
and then you have something called the historic linguistics. So we have seen gentle linguistics. We have uh, uh, seen, um, yes, domain of uh, historic linguistics. We have seen general linguistics where you talked about uh, the descriptive linguistics and what general linguistics is all about. And then we moved on to, yes, uh, historic linguistics. Here, it talks about the interconnections, the interlink, okay, between different languages in the world. We have uh, hundreds and hundreds of languages in this world. But sometimes at that one particular point of time or uh, at one particular point of uh, source or any characteristic feature or culture or context, you may find that there are connections between the different languages in the world. Because, for example, English, Latin, Greek, Russian, Gaelic, Hindi and many other languages, they are spoken in Europe and India, and they have one common ancestor that's the support Proto Indo European languages. Yes, you have uh, English, German, Dutch, Norwegian, and many other Germanic languages. They have the common ancestor that is Proto Germanic. You can't ever, ever, never, ever imagine that how English, Latin, Greek, and Hindi. Uh, Sanskrit, they are interconnected or interrelated. They are, but they are, and we have to admit that. So here, historic linguistics, it studies their historical developments and how languages evolve and they change through time. And different languages, they have one same past parent uh, language. So that is what historical linguistics uh, studies or analyzes and how cultural contact for example you migrate you move on to Middle East you stay there for 10 years or 15 years your language your war boss your repertoire of language will be uh, very strongly influenced or impacted by the Arabic languages so many words for example I would say personally like majlis is there the kahwa is there, and uh, what do you say? Mm, yeah, such words. So many, so many Arabic words. So many Middle East terms, and the hookah, and uh, so many uh, the desert safaris and the sand dunes. So many uh, things invigorate into your language. You use it. Your diction is manipulated by the Arabic culture. You migrate. You. Uh, go to what do you say europe you settle in canada or you settle in australia and you spend uh, lots many years there and you will find gradually your verbos your language highly very strongly influenced by the european languages so many jargon so many australian flavor so many so much of canadian flavor enhances enhances and colors or uh, it impacts your language, it impacts your uh, talk, your words, your diction, etc. So that is it. And then we move on to something called uh, comparative linguistics, which we have already seen how gender linguistics has been broadly classified into historic descriptive and comparative. So his comparative linguistics was formerly uh, known as comparative grammar, which is the study of relationships or correspondences between two or more languages. This is what I said. Same thing, like the historical. Historical linguistics actually traces the evolution. But then comparative means it shows. It uh, learned this, it's apparent that the different languages, two or more languages, they share a common ancestor, okay? And you have different, uh, so many old languages, very, very, very old languages. You start with Sanskrit, you have Tamil, and it seems that the Times of India considers or hails or establishes Tamil, the Tamil language as the oldest, you know, uh, Tamil is considered to be the uh, the oldest 
the only language which is the oldest in the world, along with Sanskrit. So these two are considered as the oldest languages in the world. And then you have uh, Latin, which is very old, the third oldest languages in the world. So first, the first position goes to Tamil language, and then comes Sanskrit, and then comes Latin, and then you have the Hebrew language, which... Uh, falls under the Semitic branch of the Sami Hali language family. The Hebrew is 3,000 years old, while Tamil language and Sanskrit language, they are 5,000 to 6,000 years old. And then you have the Egyptian language, which is the very oldest known language in Egypt, almost 2,600 or 2,000 years old from Christ. But then this language is still keeping its nature alive, though Hebrew and Latin has faded out yes then maybe uh, greek greek and chinese very old yes but then um 13 million of people almost they still speak greek today that is quite interesting to know that and then chinese of course you call it the standardized chinese is called the mandarin languages i'm just um, sharing my information of the oldest very old languages of the world with you and uh, currently almost 1.2 billion people speak Chinese now and the Arabic language of course. This language is found in Hebrew and Arabic languages today so there is close connection onto connections as we have said between Arabic and uh, Armenian language or the Hebrew language of course and then you have the Kor Korean language Korean is there and then the Ar Armenian language. It's also part of the Indo-European linguistic group. And uh, the Armenian language, uh, at present, I think 5%, it seems, 5% of people speak this particular language. So these are the... Uh, so this is... Uh, I spoke on or I shared such information with you to say that different languages, they share a common ancestor. Okay, so comparative uh, grammar or comparative linguistics as we call it today, it was also called comparative philology and this was originally developed or pioneered by Sir William Jones in 1786 that Sanskrit, so this is how he started his first work, the outset of his comparative uh, work, the philologist Sir William Jones found that Sanskrit was related to Latin, Greek, and German. It's quite amazing. Yes, here you can have just a look at the study of language relationships, where you have comparative linguistics, historical linguistics, and then see certain words. Languages changes, not what's right, wrong, good, or bad. That's it. Yes, here you have, uh, again, uh, I have uh, shared a lot many slides from which you can write your own notes, you can prepare your own uh, writings, etc. Okay, so there ends the first distinction where we have seen gender linguistics, Comparative linguistics, historical linguistics, and descriptive linguistics. So that dichotomy is over. Now we move on to another important distinction, a broad classification, a very, very broad classification between theoretical linguistics and applied linguistics. Okay, theoretical linguistics, which is concerned with the the developing models of linguistic knowledge and where applied linguistics is, um, it exclusively deals with the application of linguistic theories and uh, how the analysis, how the systematic study of linguistics, how is it attributed or how is it applied practically to the different walks and rhythms of life the different aspects of knowledges and the different branches, uh, perspectives of learning. When all these learnings, knowledges, life, 
life moments or or life uh, what do you say uh, perspectives everything is being impacted by the introduction or the application of these linguistic studies then and there arises or this give birth to a number of applied linguistic branches okay here you can have a good look at it this is a visual representation where at one glance you'll have the different branches of uh, theoretical linguistics and applied linguistics Theoretical linguistics, as I have already told you, it's a branch of linguistic that is most concerned with developing models of linguistic knowledge. For example, how sounds are produced, how voice is produced, how these sound segments, they join together to form uh, morphemes. So it begins with your sound production, the speech organs, then and there you will have all those things that you have learned under phonetics, phonology, morphology, uh, semantics, discourse analysis, syntax, etc., etc. Everything comes under the core of theoretical linguistics. Okay, how sounds are produced, how speech organs produce voice, and what are the different voices and sound systems, how they join together, how meaning is being produced or evolved and how these words are arranged to form sentences and how sentences are constructed and used in special contexts and such things. So all these comes under theoretical linguistics and then you have applied linguistics. It's an interdisciplinary field of study. It identifies, it analyzes, it explores, and it finds a lot of resolutions and it offers solutions to language-related real-life problems. How or to what extent a language enhances or language impacts or language influences real-life problems and what happens when linguistic uh, um, rules and theories are applied to real life. What happens to it? So some of the academic fields, they are related to applied linguistics, for example, neuroscience, psychology, sociology, anthropology, ethnicity, education. When all these are being influenced or impacted by the theory, I mean, the linguistic theories, what happens to it? So a lot, many branches evolved out of this. Here again, you will have a uh, this distinction, I am sharing multiple slides on the same topic so that you can choose easily comprehensible notes and uh, according to your wish. I am repeating again, I'm sharing multiple slides on same topics again and again so that you can take down your notes, whichever notes, whichever, uh, I don't know, I mean, we can't say which portion or a set of notes you'll be, be easily uh, uh, is easy to grasp and certain uh, you may find it sophisticated and a bit more tough and hard to uh, understand so you can take down your own notes you can uh, scribble jot down lecture points etc so this is again the same thing in a different way explained and delineated in uh, another style Again, you have this uh, distinction and definition of theoretical linguistics and applied linguistics. You can read through. And if you find it uh, comprehensible, of course, you can take it down. Yes. So theoretical uh, linguistics begins from the basic, the elemental uh, structure or the elemental, the, the, the foundation speech you know what it is it's the act or it's the rendering or expressing or or describing thoughts feelings or perceptions by the articulation of the words of course you have already a couple of years of learning phonetics and phonology you are adept in all these things so you know i i needn't explain all those things and here the branch of linguistics that deals with the production of speech sounds their combination, how they are described and defined and representation, 
they are represented by written symbols. All those things fall under phonetics. What is phonetics? And you have uh, different branches of phonetics. It's very easily explained there. What is articulatory phonetics? Articulation means producing, rendering, uttering the speech organs, your mouth, your lips, your tongue, your soft palate, your hard palate, alveolum, your larynx and pharynx and vocal cords, glottis, everything, all your speech organs, the breath, okay, the, uh, all these things, they operate to produce voiced and voiceless sounds. And then you have um, acoustic phonetics. It's the transmission and physical properties of uh, speech sounds, how these are being transmitted. Okay. And then you have the auditory, of course, uh, pertains to the speech sounds, the perception, how your ears uh, receives or perceives this. So there goes articulatory, acoustic, and auditory phonetics. The three branches of phonetics. Now, what is phonology? Here, phonetics is different from phonology, where it studies the distribution of sounds in a language as well as the interaction between those different sounds. So, that is what phonology is all about. In phonetics, you are learning about uh, that is how speech sounds are produced and how they are described, how they are defined. And then you have seen the articulatory phonetics, how it deals with the, the, uh, the production of speech sounds and acoustic phonetics, how it talks about the transmit, the physical, how it is produced, whether it is voiced or voiceless. Uh, whether nasal sounds are produced or oral sounds are produced, the physical properties of that sounds produced. That's what acoustic phonetics is all about. And then you have the auditory phonetics. But phonology is different. Phonology is uh, uh, different from phonetics because it is studying the patterns of the sounds in a language and across the languages. It is the study of uh, the categorical organization of speech sounds how speech sounds are organized in mind and how they are used to convey okay uh, convey uh, meaning for example uh, phonemes are there in the suprasegmental um, elements like the intonation is there stress is there uh, rhythm is there all these things are there this is what you call as phonology how they are uh, they are they are designed defi devised how these for you you know that basic elements of our speech is of course phonemes and that's what you deal with in uh, phonetics but in phonetics you are dealing with how the speech organs produce the sounds okay but in contrary to that in phonology you are talking more about phonemes Okay, it analyzes the speech into discrete segments called the phonemes. But then, more than that, it extends over to what you call the pitch, the intonation, and the stress. Such aspects and such elements. Suprasegmental features, we will uh, deal with or we will explain and discuss it in the upcoming video lessons. So, I just want you to know the uh, sharp contrast of the distinction between phonetics and phonology. Phonology deals with how these sounds are distributed in a language. What is pitch? What is intonation? Your voice is raised. Your intonation is high. Your intonation is low. It's sometimes middle. And the stress, I mean, for example, when you say the word about, you don't say it about, it's about where the stress falls on the second syllable. Of course, you know all these things. So this is what phonology is concerned with. So that's the difference between phonetics and phonology. Okay. Again, I'm sharing you another slide where you can read through what phonology is the study of uh, 
the description of distinctive sounds, that is how phoneme is distributed, word-to-word -word relations in sentences, and how these sound patterns are affected by the combination of the words. Okay. So you have more definitions on what phonology is. You can read through. Again, these are the branches of phonology where you have the, I have just explained it a couple of minutes back, what these are. You needn't learn all these things in detail, but then you should have, as uh, scholars of language and linguistics, you are supposed to know at least a simple definition of all these words. You need to know what language is, you need to know what linguistics is, what are the different branches of languages, linguistics, and what is exactly the difference between phonology and phonetics, what is segment, suprasegmental features, what is morphology, what is phonology, what is auditory perception, all these things you need to know at least a simple definition of all these things. Okay. You have a segmental uh, phonology, you have a suprasegmental, you have the diachronic phonology, it's a diachronic phonology and the synchronic phonology. We will have exclusive video lessons on what is diachronic and synchronic. So we will be describing, we will be defining and discussing all those things in the other lessons. Okay. Yeah. Then comes a little more um, higher, a bigger, a more sophisticated level, morphology, of course. It studies the structure and formation of morphemes or words, where there are minimal units of sound, speed sounds, which has got meaning. It's simple and plain as that. It's the minimal unit of grammatical analysis. Right? So, as learners of linguistics, you should be or you have to be capable in uh, a couple of, uh, after attending a couple of lessons, lectures, uh, a learner, a scholar of linguistics must be able to be equipped or capable to define, define words, define linguistic segments define language elements for example what is a morpheme somebody ask you what is exactly a morpheme okay you can't you can say in simple words that it is the basic uh, uh, sound system the tiniest the smallest sound system which has got a meaning of course that's a morpheme uh, and you can say it in simple word it is of course a word it's a word it has got a sound, it has got a meaning. But then as linguistic scholars, you need to say that it is the minimal unit of grammatical analysis. So this is uh, what uh, learning linguistics make you or you end up as a scholar who is able to define words in this way. Again, a definition for morphology, how it deals with the arrangement and relationship of the smallest meaningful units in a language. Unlike phonemes, they are simply sounds. They don't give you any meanings. Yes. And what is syntax? We have been... Uh, learning, we have been uh, listening to what phonetics is, the branches of phonetics, what is phonology, what is morphology, and now we move on to the next level of uh, complication or a bit more complex system of the language, it's syntax, what is syntax? Syntax simply deals with the arrangement of these morphemes of words into a structure. It is the arrangement where you have a sentence. A sentence is made out of 
words or morphemes. That is simply what you call as syntax. Syntax is the grammar. That is the structure or order of the elements in a language statement. You have the SVO pattern for English and then you have the SOV or the other different, different, different languages have their own different um, patterns or arrangement of words. So here you have a syntax. Please go through that. You can read it. It's simple. It deals with uh, how words are arranged to form phrases, how they form clauses, and ultimately how they form um, sentences. Okay, so few words joined together to give you a particular meaning is what you call a phrase. But a phrase can't stand on its own. It must be uh, joined or it must be given permission to attach itself to a, a bigger phrase or a sentence, only then it has existence. But then clause is different. Clause is independent. It can stand on its own, even if it is not a part of a sentence. So uh, morphemes or words, words arranged in phrases, or words arranged to form clauses, or words arranged to form sentences is all that you learn in syntax. As a grammatical structure of sentences. So I told you, I'm giving you multiple slides with simple definitions, simpler definitions, and a bit more complex definitions. Now, semantics simply means meaning. It's a study of meaning of words phrases and sentences. You can say lexical, which also means relationship of meaning, words and meaning relationship about words. And then you have phrasal or sentential semantic, that is syntactic units larger than a word. So relationship between the meaning and uh, the meaning relationship among words can be termed as the lexical semantics and the meaning relationship between Bigger or larger syntactic units are called phrasal or semantics. You have idioms and phrases, of course. So the meaning relationship, the relationship of the different meanings. Yeah, that is called the semantics. What a speaker conventionally means, not what he is trying to say. You say something, you have a literal meaning, you have a local or a subjective meaning for that. But uh, other than that, you have some objective or general meaning for that. Uh, you say uh, a table, uh, the, the table is made of wood, of course. You have your own subjective uh, uh, meaning for that and you have an objective generalized meaning for that, of course. You, when you uh, explain it or when you dismantle it on our subjective terms you have so many emotions and feelings and thoughts and ideas attributed to it but when you when a listener uh, listens to it or hears that the table is made of word of course he, uh, 10 people listen to the same statement has got an objective general meaning or understanding that this is a table and it is made of word nothing more than that so that is what you call by semantics. Semantics has got two branches. It's just for information with lexical semantics or phrasal semantics. Lexical means words. Okay. And the meanings of words. And phrasal semantics means it rela it's related or it pertains to the meaning of a, a bigger uh, chunks of uh, words. That is phrases or clauses. The meanings of phrases or the meanings of clauses. The relationship between that is called phrasal semantics or sentential semantics. I hope uh, it has made some sense to you. So simply semantics means it's the study of meanings of words, phrases and sentences. Yeah, here it's a pictorial, a visual representation of what semantics is. Now he, the dog, utters to his friend dog. Yes, 
So in his mind, he has got a visual representation. And um, the other person who listens to it, he has got his own representation of a dog. So if you are trying to create common meanings, this helps everyone understand each other. So that's why, that's what semantics study, semantics describe, analyze, trace, and uh, explores or investigates the uh, sophisticated, the complex relationship between uh, meanings of words, meanings of phrases, and meanings of sentences. That's what you learn under semantics. Again, a simple definition for you. Then comes pragmatics. Of course, um, the word itself obviously gives you uh, what it's all about. The study of the relationship between linguistic forms and how you use it. The practical, realistic use of language and the users of those forms. The relationship you have certain linguistic forms. What are those linguistic forms? Words, sounds, uh, phrases, clauses, sentences. You have all these linguistic forms with you. And the relationship between all these things and us. You are listening to, to my words and... Pragmatics is the relationship between all these words which I'm uttering and delivering to you and myself. And you're listening to my talk, my words, of course, and the relationship between those words and yourself. That is what uh, pragmatics explores or investigates. Again, you have uh, authoritative uh, definitions of pragmatics. Please read through. Pragmatics um, are concerned with the interpreters. Relation of these signs to their interpreters. Every word is a sign. Again, I tell you, we will have uh, upcoming video lessons on the semiotics or the theory of signs. S-I-G-N-S, signs. Every word is a sign. You say apple, it is a sign. You say table, it's a sign. You say I, it's a sign. Everything. So the scientific study of signs, S-I-G-N-S. Don't uh, confuse it. The scientific study of signs, S-I-G-N-S. That's what you call the semiotics. Okay. We shall have... a. Uh, more discussions on those things. So pragmatics explores or delves deeper into the relationship between linguistic forms, words, phrases, clauses, sentences, and its users. Okay, and how it is. So you, you speak something and you're a listener, you're a speaker, and you have uh, attributed your own meaning to that. And your listeners perceive your voice, they perceive your words, they perceive your facial expressions, everything. And it is interpreted in their own ways. Pragmatics again. Described by David Pristil as the branch of knowledge which studies the factors that govern our choice of language and social interaction and the effects of our choice on others. To see that the choice of language and social interaction governs our choice, our choice, and the effects of our choice on others. So that is it. In contrast to phonetics and phonology, morphology, syntax, and so forth, which describe the Please focus on that particular point. It describes the different levels of language structure. Language structure. I repeat, phonetics, phonology, morphology, syntax, etc. Till now, it focused, emphasized on language structure. Now, here comes the level of uh, theoretical linguistics which we are looking at now, where 
language study is dealt with its use and that is pragmatics. It's concerned with the relationship between linguistic signs and their users and it investigates how the situational and the linguistic context affects the meaning of utterances. So simple as that, the connection, the relationship between language and its users. That's what pragmatics is all about. Again, a column wise distinction, clear cuts, one at a, I mean, at a single glance, you will have it demarcated into two branches with the difference between semantics and pragmatics, where semantics deals with meanings, whereas pragmatics deals with the use of words and their context and where semantics studies the literal meaning of the literal sense but pragmatics depends on the use of words and their context okay because uh, so many words they change their meanings they change their meanings according to the change in context. That's why pragmatic studies, the intended or the inferred meaning as well. Semantic studies, the literal meaning, where uh, a word has got its literal meaning. You can Google it up. You can check uh, it up with a lexicon. You can take up the dictionaries of thesaurus and you can check. You will have literal meanings and literal sense there. But pragmatics is not concerned with the literal sense. It is more concerned or it deals with or it analyzes the inferred meaning, what lies beyond the lines, beyond the words or behind the curtain. It depends upon the context. Yes. Now, what do you mean by discourse analysis? <clears throat> It's a stretch of language which is longer than a sentence. I have told you in the other previous video lessons what a discourse is. Discourse is speech or writing. It's a piece of writing or speech. A piece, a particular portion of written or spoken form of language. That's what you call as discourse. And discourse analysis uh, it studies, it's an analysis of learning, uh, describing, defining, analyzing systematically and scientifically what these stretches of languages, which is longer than a sentence. I am going to church. It is, of course, a sentence. Words are arranged here and that is called syntax. Words are I am going to the church all these are words and they are the morphemes isn't it and these morphemes are joined together and that is what you call a syntax and when i say i'm going to the church today you understand that i have something some errands some course or activities at the church maybe prayer maybe to attend the mass or maybe to meet the clergy the priest there. So many things are there and that's what you call as pragmatics. You can assume, you can uh, infer so many things. Why Miss is going to church today maybe to meet the priest, father, or maybe for a confession, or maybe to attend a wedding, or she's going to the church for attending the mass. Maybe she's going uh to attend a funeral, you don't know that, you're assuming, you're inferring so many things and the real meaning comes out of uh, the context. Now if I tell you my grandmother was uh, ill, she was uh, really bedridden and last week she was shifted to the hospital and then today early morning I call you up and tell you that I'm going to the church you can infer maybe somebody close to me or some relative with their grandmother has passed away. 
Of course you can infer. That is what you call by pragmatics. Depending on the context, you are evolving meanings out of that. And my sentence, I am going to the church today morning. When I say that, it is a simple, it is just a sentence which asserts that I am going to church. You can't infer, you, you, you don't have much more explanation. You don't have any other idea about that, but you in, infer about it. Now, when I tell you I'm going to the church today morning because the priest has uh, called me or the priest has rang up a couple of days back because he wanted to discuss uh, uh, something related to my children's, uh, what do you say, catechism, Sunday classes or something like that. So there, it's a stretch of uh, talk. It is a stretch of speech there. And analyzing this is what you call as discourse analysis. When a discourse is being uh, rendered or, or when a discourse is being uh, transferred, it actually has got a purpose. Every discourse has got a purpose, maybe spoken or written. And there will be a meaning for that and it, it will have a coherence. There is an order. You can't say that uh, my children went to, didn't go to the Sunday classes. Priest called me up today morning. See, I'm going to the church today. You can't say this in this way. It's, uh, it's confusing and it's irrational. It's illogical. There should be a coherence. So every discourse has got a purpose, a meaning, and it has got some coherence to it. And it is bigger than a sentence. I hope um, you followed. Again, it's an etymological uh, information about discourse, which is derived from a Latin word, discourses, which means run about. So that means... It's running, it's running and making it expanding, it's expanding and it's increasing its size from that of a sentence. Okay. So there goes the definition, the etymology of discourse. It is derived from a Latin word discursus, which means run about, means it's bigger in size rather than a sentence. Of course, keep in mind one thing, a discourse should have a context, a circumstance or an environment. Only there a discourse exists. You should pinpoint or you should delineate the context in which this discourse is spoken or written. Again, you have more explanations and uh, you have definitions. You may choose your own, you have your own choice of selection, selecting definitions and notes and lectures and points of your own. Whichever suits more, you may opt to learn it. I repeatedly tell you one thing, linguistics is something that you have to learn regularly on a regular basis. Learn it. I cannot give you the whole thing. Everything can't be, what you say, imposed upon you within a short period of time. There should be regular uh, intervals of time for you to understand, write, learn, grasp, and digest and register in your mind. And uh, please don't think that linguistics is something you learn a couple of days before your exams. So I would like you to have a thorough and fundamental knowledge on everything, every concept, every term, every definition uh, in linguistics because this is our foundation. Okay, now we move on to applied linguistics where we have, uh, we have completed theoretical linguistics. Now we are Moving on to applied linguistics. I'm not explaining much. It's easy because you needn't uh, uh, spend hours and so much of time to learn the definitions of all these things. This much uh, meager amount of definition and uh, explanation is needed for that. You have a uh, when linguistics is being applied to, I told you, the different walks of life 
different branches of learning and different branches of knowledge. You have uh, certain other branches, a uh, series of linguistical approaches. Anthropology, of course, you know, it deals with the study of uh, human beings, anthropology. So, uh, anthropological linguistics deals, has got two uh, elements or two branches for that. Anthropology is the scientific study of human beings and human behavior and societies, tracing it in the past and the present. You have a social anthropology and you have a linguistic anthropology. So all these things are connected. That's why I told you applied linguistics is interdisciplinary. It has got underlying connections, interconnections, networks, um, links. Everything is being blended and uh, connected. The threads are tied into a knot okay every every subject and every discipline has got so much of uh, uh, resemblances similarities dissimilarities and they depend on each other you can't simply filter out a particular discipline these days everything has to be interdisciplinary we are heading towards such kind of uh, learnings and knowledge the cognition of uh, knowledge and uh, learning is heading or moving towards the trajectory is towards that of an interdisciplinary kind of education that we need hereafter to confront a post-pandemic uh, world. I would say that because uh, we have to face a lot of challenges. It's challenging, you know, but at the same time, it's more, uh, it gives you it opens up a lot of opportunities and prospects. We have to see. Uh, we, we can't simply be blind to that uh, aspect of the world today. So anthropological anthropology means learning the human behavior, human societies and humans as such. That's anthropology. So under that, you have ethnolinguistics. It studies the relationship between language and ethnicity. Ethnicity is a culture. And then social linguistics it studies the relationship between language and social relations. You have different cultures um, in your society, in your neighborhood itself. We belong to different communities. We have our own religious faiths, customs and traditions and so many words are there. So much of a language and linguistic elements and linguistic forms are there. Underlying every community, every religious sect and every uh, ethnic groups. So that is what you call the ethnolinguistics. And social relationship. Your relationship with the college. Your relationship with the education system. Your relationship between the... Uh, jurisdiction of uh, India, your relationship with the government, your relationship with the transport system and your relation with the uh, industry, different industries, trade, currency, etc, etc. All these are your social relationships. So language plays a predominant role in all these things and you have your own jargons for each relationships. This is what social linguistics studies. Yes, again, you have a contrast between social linguistics and sociology of language. Social linguistics focuses on the society, on language. And sociology of language, it's the language effects on society. There it is. There's a sharp contrast. The scientific uh, linguistics, of course, is a, st a scientific study of human language, its meaning, form, context, etc., etc. But social linguistics, it's a study of language in relation to society. Again, you have a very minute, uh, what do you say, a very minute distinction between social linguistics and sociology of language. There it is. Uh, the, how the impact and the influence of a society on language. That is the relationship between language and society. Language is being studied or analyzed in its connection with the 
human beings or society. That's what sociolinguistics is all about. But sociology of language is the effect of language. When language is being used, when communication, when human communication is being used, what happens to the society? How far a society is being um, influenced or impacted by the usage of language? Again, you have uh, lot many simple and interesting definitions on uh, social linguistics and characteristics of that, where social linguistics is a science which is which uh, studies or which describes or explores the relationship be between language and society, and it considers that language is a social construct just like you talk about gender these days gender is a social construct isn't it likewise um, or you say woman man all these are social construct isn't it feminism everything so like that a language is a social and cultural phenomenon and social linguistics studies uh, language in its social context how real life experiences and real life situations are taken into empirical study and it is related to methodology and contents of social sciences too it of course like in social linguistic language is connected or language is being taken off carried off and uh, learned in compare in comparison to and it is being compared and contrasted to any social sciences for example, sociology is there, cultural studies is there, geography is there, history is there, civic, economics, so much of our social sciences are there. So environmental studies, disaster management, so many things are there. So this is what uh, social linguistics is all about. Yes, again, you have ethno-linguistics. The language, the interrelationship or the interconnections between language and the cultural behavior of all those who speak it. This is how Britannica defines ethnolinguistics. It is a branch of anthropological linguistics. Of course, keep in mind, anthropological linguistics has got two important branches, ethnolinguistics and sociolinguistics. Yes, something related to psychology. I'm talking on and on and you're listening to it. And what happens to our mind when we use language? When I speak and when I uh, talk to you and you listen to me, we are joined together or we are united on the domain of language. And what happens to our mind? That is what you call as psycholinguistics. It's a branch of uh, linguistics which studies the relationship between psychology, human psychology and linguistics. Uh, the relationship between human mind and the language as it examines the process that occur in brain while producing and perceiving both written and spoken discourse. So this actually emerged in the late 1950s and 60s as a result of Chomsky revolution. We have already seen in the previous video lesson who Chomsky is, his contribution in a partial way. I have explained and you have listened to that and you have seen the uh, landmark works by Noam Chomsky and his considerable inevitable presence in the evolution and advancement and even now the important role that Chomsky plays as far as language, linguistics and anthropology and philosophical sciences is concerned. Again, you have um, simple definitions on psycholinguistics. Of course, it's a part of cognitive science and it has got connections. It's interdisciplinary with the informatics linguistics and neuroscience okay what happens to the human brain or human mind when language is being operated between human beings yes 
Now, what does that mean, geolinguistics? Of course, the term itself gives you a lot of uh, ideas related to the geographical con uh, I mean, uh, concepts, the geographical areas, the land, nation, country, etc., etc., landscape. Yes. Geographers, why do they use language or why do they study language? These are the reasons. So the study of language is called linguistic geography and geolinguistics by geographers. They see there are so many things uh, which are upcoming. You have a uh, uh, in connection or pertaining to which is very pertinent to geolinguistics. You have uh, called. Uh, I'm just mentioning it to you. Literary mapping takes place. Literary cartography takes place. And uh, geolinguistics, as we said right now. And something called the spatial literature. Language and space. Language and geography. Language and continents. Language and country. The space where you place yourself. The place or the space where you uh, fix your story. You write a poem, you write a prose piece, you write fiction, you write theater, you write dramas, anything. You have a locale for that. You fix or you place your story there, isn't it? Why? Why do you place it in that particular space, in that land? There will be a reason for you. So... Geo uh, linguistics gives you a power view, gives you a vantage point of view relation between uh, language and geography. That is, um, it facilitates cultural diffusion of innovations and how customs and skills pass from one generation to next. And languages are carried, languages travel a lot. It's the sense of region and place that geographers are talking about. And geolinguists, they learn this, the relationship between language and how these languages are carried off by human beings from community to community, culture to culture, nation to nation, and continent to continent. Human beings travel and journey all over the globe, all over the world, and thereby the language is being transmitted. Uh, languages move to and fro. They come in and they move out. They come in and they go out of cultures, communities, geographical uh, la landscapes, places, regions, continents, countries, uh, societies everywhere. So this is what geolinguists are concerned with. Here, something in relation to neurolinguistics, the neural mechanisms in human brain that control, you know, there are different lobes in your brain and each lobe is specific and uh, restricted to the learning of cognition and perception of several uh, different, each, each lobe, each portion of your brain is connected or is concerned with or it is specific to the learning or cognition of different branches of knowledges. Uh, a person who is adept in, very expert in science, his, I mean, a particular lobe or region of his brain is working. And a person who is uh, well-versed in arts and literature, something else, some other part or region or lobe of his brain is working, is operating. A person who dance, a person who sings, a person... I mean, you have different skills, you have different faculties, you have different powers embedded in you. So all these are interconnected with the different regions of your brains and your neural uh, system, the nerve system of your body. So... A human brain helps you to comprehend, to produce and acquire language. And there is something you have uh, uh, 
I know, I don't know whether you have heard what you call uh, LAD, the language acquisition device, which is operating in every human being. Because you listen to language, you learn a language or you acquire a language that is uh, accessible or uh, accessible or that is being listened to by your sensory perceptors, that is your ears. Your ears, your sensory perceptors catch uh, language or voices and that is the first thing and your language acquisition device operates in you and that is what that is how you acquire language so even if you are born in India if you are taken off uh, they uh, within a couple of days after your birth you are taken to Europe and somebody is uh, taking care of you there of course you will be speaking English as a native speaker even if you are born to Indian parents that doesn't matter Likewise, a European child, if it's, he's born, I mean, he's born here in India, of course, his language, his talk and his accent, everything will be pertaining to that of the Indian English uh, conversation or the Indian English style of uh, talking or speaking. So the uh, sensory perceptors and the neural system that works or operates in every human means. It controls the comprehension, the production and acquisition of language. So that is what neurolinguists learn. The physiological mechanisms by which brain processes information related to language. Please read that again. Neurolinguistics or neurolinguists, they studies physiological mechanisms by which the brain processes information. You listen to language you uh, the the body or the neural system inside you it works it operates it takes messages to the uh, brain and brain uh, what do you say analyzes it or brain controls all these information in connection to language acquisition and language comprehension and language production you have to listen to somebody in order to speak, right? Now, I am speaking to you and you are listening to it. Later on, you comprehend all these things and then you produce your own knowledge, your own uh, academics related to it, your own notes related to it, and then you acquire all these things and then you produce it in your papers or you, uh, you produce it when you speak. When I ask you a question, you comprehend it, you listen to it, you perceive it, you, you, the cognitive domain is working and then... You understand that, you comprehend, and then you reply. Isn't it? This is the process taking place. And the neural system in the brain plays a very significant role in that. Physiological means it's... The physiological mechanism means it deals with the normal functioning of living organisms and their parts. That's what you mean by physiology. For example, you have uh, so many things in your body, like uh, enzymes are there, Mem proteins are there, mitochondria is there, your heart system is there, your nervous system is there, your reproductive system is there, your uh, respiratory system is there. How does all these work? That is categorized as physiology. So likewise, the physiological mechanism, the system working, uh, the uh, physiology, it deals with the functioning, the normal, the regular functioning of the system. The respiratory system, the uh, metabolic system, the bodily uh, system, the nervous system, the all all these kind of uh, systems take place. The hormonal system, all these things work on a regular basis. They work normally in a human being, and that is what you call as physiology. It's a branch of biology which deals with the normal functioning of a human body. So this kind of normal functioning takes place pertaining to the brain. The brain controls all these things. What? The listening, the perception of language, the comprehension of language, the production of language and acquiring of language. So all these things are being learned under neurolinguistics. Neurolinguistics again. Here you have uh, visual diagrams. It's just for your information. 
It's a study which interests in abstract knowledge and comprehension system of language in brain. We know so many systems are working inside our body, not visible to us. Not visible to us doesn't mean that it doesn't happen there. So this is brain, different hemispheres, different lobes are there. And each area is exclusively specific to different domains of learning and knowledge. So this is what neurolinguistics is all about. Yes. There is something called the biolinguistics. Now here is just a tidbit for you where uh, Chomsky, and, uh, Chomsky talks about the biolinguistics. The generative, he, he has got his own uh, ideas, he has got his own findings and explorations on biolinguistics. And uh, here he considers language as a biological endowment, it's innate. I told you language acquisition device. It interacts with other cognitive systems. So these are Chomsky's findings. Now this Biolinguistics is, of course, the study of biology and the evolution of language. Just keep those two things in mind. Bi the study of biology and evolution of language. It's highly interdisciplinary, which opens up to very exotic, new and fresh insights, informations, research prospects for you guys. Of course, you can keep all these things in your mind. Uh, whenever you are planning to take about research. Now, this is related to various fields like biology, linguistics, psychology, mathematics, neurolinguistics. All these explains what? Formation of language, comprehension of language by human brain and how human neural system operates or functions. You see, you know how reproduction takes place, you know how digestion takes place, you know how ex excretion takes place, isn't it? Likewise, we need to know how scientifically language, language elements, language forms, language structures and language meanings are being operated within this human body, human brain and human nerve system and how you accept, how you perceive, how you comprehend how you describe how you analyze how you register how you digest all these things just like neruda says i eat words i fondle words i sing words i run after words likewise this is what uh, it's the best example it's a very pertinent example to quote neruda here yes of course we need to know what all processes are taking place in connection with the language within our body so that's what uh, biolinguistics deals about and chomsky has uh, got uh, his own uh, contributions to that here you have uh, uh, a definition for applied linguistics and biolinguistics and clinical linguistics so by uh, when the Language, when language related issues are addressed or applied to everyday life, uh, a series of uh, new branches like sociolinguistics, ethnolinguistics, psycholinguistics, neurolinguistics, geolinguistics, so many things are born. And biolinguistics, of course, it's a study of natural as well as human thought communication systems in animals compared to human language that is what i told you the relationship between biology and evolution of language and then you have something called clinical linguistics linguistic theory is applied to the field of speech language pathology that's what clinical linguistics all these things are for your information but we need to know what is what and uh, how different how distinct and how similar and dissimilar all these branches are so, I have uh, mentioned, I'm showing you two important works, the, minimal, the minimalist program, the nature and plausibility. Possibility means the credibility, the trust, the possibility or the authenticity of a Chomsky's bilinguistics. It's a very fresh uh, research-oriented uh, branch and then you have uh, 
the biolinguistic enterprise. Just imagine because um, uh, research uh, proposals and research prospects are moving on to or heading on to very new, very uh, fresh and exotic uh, branches and realms and uh, domains, you know. Uh, contrary to the past, to the classical or the traditional way of uh, researches, you are trying to, uh, our researchers are trying to collaborate uh, literature with the new, new areas of uh, disciplines, subjects, and areas. So uh, that's what I told you Langu language is being connected or compared and contrasted to. Science, mathematics, geography, and so many other social sciences, and new, insightful, fresh, quite interesting, and quite uh, unbelievable and amazing uh, insights and informations are being born and emerged and evolved because uh, you know that language never uh, becomes, language is always becoming, it is evolving, evolving every moment. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening and thank you for watching. See you in the next video lesson.